I invite you to turn in your Bible to uh, Matthew chapter 3. I'd like to get started there this morning, Matthew 3. Enjoyed the opportunity to worship with you today. I appreciate uh, the songs Eli selected, and I think it's a good thing to teach me a few new songs along the way. You know, we got about a thousand in this book, and it's good to learn some that we've maybe not sung as often, but they're good words and help us to appreciate God more and His words. So I am grateful for the chance I've had to worship with you this morning. Donald mentioned also about our plan this afternoon to have our classes, the uh, class for the ladies and then the class for the men. We're studying the subject of leadership, and I'd like to second his uh, encouragement to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, if you're able to, uh, it's, a, it's a, a chance to think about some great leaders in the Bible and about how we can be more like them, things that we need to develop and to strengthen in our personalities uh, to be able to lead. Uh, I certainly don't believe that leadership is limited to men in, in one sense. I think we have folks of all ages and both genders that are leaders in their own way, but that's a special effort that we have as fellows to get together there. One of the things that I asked uh, the, the members of that class to do last time we were together, we were looking at Nehemiah uh, and uh, the great vision Nehemiah had. And we said that if there are things that, uh, when you think about the vision that we need for this work, the church here at North Bill, and uh, looking into the future, Lord willing, a year from now, five years from now, you know, what can we be doing now uh, in order to improve the effectiveness of this congregation, not only without, but within. And so I hope people have been thinking and praying about that. And uh, if you have some suggestions and thoughts you'd like to bring to that, please do so. If, if you're not going to be in that meeting, uh, if you want to write something down, pass it along to Donald or myself, I'd very much, we'd very much be glad to see it, uh, as uh, we certainly want to have a vision in this congregation and uh, try to improve, constantly improve in our effectiveness for the Lord's work. So I do appreciate your remembering that. Okay, on to the lesson today. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 begins, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Matthew notes, saying, and he quotes Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. The same John had a raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey and then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Don't you dare say, well, we're kin to Abraham. God can take stones and raise up kin to Abraham. What he wants are penitent hearts. Now, let me tell you, that kind of preaching wasn't too popular then with everybody. It's sure not popular now. You can almost hear people saying, where's the grace? Where's the grace in that? Oh, you just got too much stress on doing don't you know that Christianity is all about forgiveness? Have heard somebody say something like that? You know that's not true, right? It's not all about forgiveness. There's a lot more than just forgiveness in this story. That's too negative. Too much fear mongering going on here. You're going to push people away. You're going to push impenitent people away. You are going to do that. They don't know that Jesus you know, went right on preaching the same message. I, was, I found this is, uh, I think this qualifies as a meme, doesn't it? Isn't that the way they use that word, meme? Uh, a while back. 
And if you can't read it, uh, I guess that's supposed to be Jesus there. And he's talking to somebody, woman at the well, I suppose. Uh, although it doesn't look like what I think those folks would probably have looked like. But anyhow, beside the point. The, um, the caption reads, I want to forgive you, but you haven't, I can't. You haven't repented. And then down here is the hashtag, stuff Jesus never said. How about that? Jesus never said, I can't forgive you because you don't repent. Uh, you know, somebody who created this either didn't know or didn't care about Luke 13, 3, where the Lord said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He, he just about said exactly that. And he often taught that lesson. And John the Baptist taught that lesson. That repentance is necessary to being forgiven. But you see, this is presenting a message. That's why the internet, whatever good it does, it does so much harm. And so many things are taught in these cute little pictures, you know, hashtags that just are just straight from the devil. What is the message of, uh, over here on the far side of the chart? It is don't, don't sweat the details. Don't worry about doing right. You know, Jesus just loves you. It doesn't matter what you do, how you live. That, that is a message straight from Satan. But it's not a message that has, uh, has gone out of style all through the years. I've got this uh, quotation here from, uh, this is from a letter that Martin Luther, the reformer back in the 1500s, wrote to his buddy, Philip Melanchthon, uh, in which, you know, Luther had come out of Catholicism and he thought that was all about works and all about earning salvation. If you say the Hail Mary this many times, that earned some, something with God. And he rejected that and rightly so. But then he flopped over so far the other way that he would write something like this to his friend. If you're really a preacher of, of mercy, do not preach a fictitious but a real mercy. If mercy is real, then you must really be a sinner. It can be no fiction. God does not save fictitious sinners. You must be a real sinner and sin boldly. But trust in Christ more boldly. And rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. Is he saying what I think he's saying? Keep reading. In this life we will sin. For this life is not a place where righteousness resides. Let me just pause there. How about that for a, a, a twist on things? When the Bible says the world's not righteous, that means we don't have to be righteous in the world. Is that, is that the same thing? Peter says we're going, we're looking for a new heaven and new earth where dwelleth righteousness. So we don't have to be concerned about avoiding sin until you get to heaven. Is that what he's saying? It suffices now that for God's glory we know the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. No sin can separate us from Him. Even if we were to commit murder or adultery thousands of times each day. Been reading a different Bible than I have. There are a lot of folks who, who teach some version of that. Maybe they're not quite as extreme. One fellow wrote, though, he was asked the question, do I have to give up my sins to be saved? He said, the answer is no. The answer is you never will give up sin. So you just might as well, what? Continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that what Paul said is, is false? So I, I, I'm answering today a request. I had a request here, and this has been a while back, so forgive me uh, for being tardy. I, I, I do get to your request on lessons. If you drop it in the box, Lord willing, I'll eventually get to it. If I don't, in a prompt manner, feel free to prompt me again. But I want to talk just for a minute this morning about a simple but vital question. What does repentance demand of us? This is not complicated, it seems to me, but it is so important and not universally acknowledged. In the first place, you know what sin demands? It demands a godly sorrow for sin. That's what repentance demands. Godly sorrow for sin. I think there's some people beyond help. We were studying recently in Isaiah. There's a memorable passage in Isaiah 22 where I think Jerusalem is in focus here. The sins of Jerusalem 
And uh, in this context, he talks about how you know, the Lord tried to reach these people and they, they just would not hear. And that's why ultimately the judgment will fall, he said. In that day, verse 12, did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and mourning and baldness and the girding of sackcloth? You ought to be sitting down in the ashes with your clothes torn, ashamed of yourself and, and, and begging God. He said, instead, joy, gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine, let us eat and drink, tomorrow we die. You know, to some people, they've just gone so far. What did Jeremiah say? They're not capable of blushing. Can't, they can't be embarrassed anymore about sin. They have no ability to feel shame. Uh, Peter talked about folks that will sit right there and, and feast with you without fear. Just as corrupt and wicked and as far from God as they can be, but they have lost their sense of shame. Others who have only that shallow repentance that consists of nothing more than the outward and not the inward. Uh, if you turn back to Hosea chapter 6, uh, that's where the Hosea writing, I think, to Israel and showing them to be the spiritual adulteress that they were. He writes, O Ephraim, what shall I do to thee? And O Judah, what shall I do to thee? Your goodness, he says, is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goes away. You ever know somebody like that? That their, their goodness, maybe their, their repentance, their sorrow, is just like the dew. You better, better look at it uh, quick, because it's going to be gone in a minute, as soon as the sun comes up. They feel real bad about it, but they get over it, and they're right back where they were. That won't do. Godly sorrow is a sorrow that demands a real and, uh, and, uh, and, and unavoidable uh, change. In the seventh chapter of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and in verse 14, God here is speaking to Solomon. And he talks about how the temple will be a place where people can come to find the blessing of God and be restored. And he writes, If my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's what it takes it takes that real, genuine, all the way down to the bold, godly sorrow that hates where we are, never wants to be back there again, and will not, will not tolerate that compromise. In the 51st Psalm, one of the great penitential psalms, David reminds us in verse 17 that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart God will not despise. And that doesn't go away with the dew. That's not I, I, I feel sort of caught here today, but by the end of the week it'll be all gone. It's got to be deeper than that. I've got to be more real than that. That's what he calls, that's what repentance is. It's that repentance that makes a change. Repentance also demands a humility, a humbling of ourselves that leads to a confession of our sin. I think about the prodigal son, I'm sure you have too through the years, who came back to his father, he didn't try to slide in the back door. The son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. If you can think of it, I admit to it. I'm guilty of it all. No hiding no excuses. It's a confession of sin. Don't ever ruin an apology with an excuse. That's an old saying. And that's exactly right. Here's a, here's a man who does not ruin an apology with an excuse. In James, the fifth chapter, in verse 16, that familiar passage, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 
But it won't avail anything if it comes from a heart that's unwilling, too proud to confess, to own up to what it's done. Repentance is not proud. In 1 John verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9, John writes, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no effort to hide, to slide around, to, to be less than candid, because what we're after is forgiveness, cleansing. We're filthy and we can't stand it for another minute and we've got to have the help that God only can give. And so there is this humility that repentance, true repentance brings. I think about that in reference to David. You know, we've read that story many times about Nathan coming to David and, uh, and, and, and putting the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the charge to him. And how David, unlike other kings, didn't have him arrested, didn't have him killed. Instead, what he said was, he's, he said, in effect, you're right. Nathan said, you're the man. And David said, that's right, I am. I'm guilty. That's what humility will do. Humility, likewise, repentance, likewise, demands that we quit the sin that we've been caught in. In Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel is a plain spoken prophet, is he not? He's a prophet of the captivity and he's talking to those captives. And uh, at one point he says, you're just dead bones, dry bones. But he said, I've got some good news. God can make the dry bones live. That's over in the 37th chapter, I think it is. I want to look at chapter 18 where he says the way to life, the way to life is through the humility of repentance. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 21, if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live and shall not die. And all his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all in the, that the wicked should die, saith the Lord, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Do you think people understand? I know you do. I trust all of us do. But do you think people understand how God, the last thing God wants to do is to condemn us? I've told the story before about Abraham Lincoln. I, I, forgive me if, if I've told it too many times. But one of the stories about Lincoln was you know, in the Civil War, there were a number of deserters on both sides, especially the Union side. And so a guy would desert, and the punishment for that was death. And But you had to have uh, presidential uh, approval to actually execute the soldier. And so these orders would come across his desk, and over and over again, Lincoln would commute the sentence. And somebody asked him about that, why he did that so often. And he said, uh, well, he had decided that it was the poorest use of a soldier to shoot him. Uh, and there's a good point in that. It's not a very good use of a soldier to shoot him. And, and God does not create us so that we might just be removed and that we might be condemned. He wants us so much to win but I've got to get over my stubbornness. That's what Ezekiel is telling these folks. God does not want to condemn you. You force him to when you're too stubborn to give up your sin. I think about a story in Ezra. Uh, this is in the return from the captivity. Back in Ezra, uh, we find Ezra has led back uh, a group of Jews to restore the teaching and the temple service. And... Uh, you know, the reason why people had uh, been taken captive to start with is they disobeyed God. And Ezra comes back and he says, you people are just as rebellious as your fathers were when he took them out to start with. You've learned nothing. And so his work really, Ezra's work was to just stir the people to have a greater reverence for God's 
will. So we just drop it in the middle here, but in the ninth chapter of Ezra, and in verse 10, he writes, And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? We have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land into which ye go to possess it is an unclean land, with the filthiness of the people of the lands, and with their abominations, which they have filled it one end to the other with their uncleanness. Now, therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take ye their daughters for your sons, nor seek peace or, or, or wealth forever with them, that is, that they may be strong, that ye rather may be strong, and that ye might eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children hereafter. Don't make alliances. Don't intermarry with these people. That's what God had told them to start with. They failed to do that. They fell in rebellion. They were taken away captive. So what happens? The captives come back. They start intermarrying with these same people. And the same cycle beginning again, Ezra says, God, please forgive us. We have been so foolish. Verse 13, after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespassing, that thou, our, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this that we should again break thy commandment and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest thou not be angry with us till thou hast consumed us? So he prays to God. And he asked that God forgive. But you know, forgiveness demands repentance. So verse 10, chapter 10 rather, verse 1. Ezra prayed and confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of God. And there assembled unto him out of Israel a great congregation of men and women and children. For the people wept very sore. There's a fellow named Shechaniah who comes forward and says to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. And that's exactly what they did. Here they had, they had taken these unlawful marriages, and God said, it's not going to be right till you've gotten out of what you got into. And that's what they did. The last verse of the 10th chapter says, these had taken, he listed a number of them. He said, these had taken strange wives. Some of them, they, by their wives, they'd had children. But God said it is not fit and right for you to stay in this unlawful marriage. Now that's a hard kind of repentance. But that's what repentance is. If something is wrong, you can't stay in it and be right. Ephesians chapter 4 of the New Testament. In verse 25, it's another reminder of that same principle. He's calling on us there to put off the old man and put on the new man. And in that discussion he says um, putting away lying speak every man truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another be ye angry and sin not let not the sun go down upon your wrath neither give place to the devil verse 28 let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to give to him that needs you can't repent of stealing if you stay in it. Let him that stole steal no more. You've got to quit the sin. In the uh, neighboring, the, 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 I suppose the sister letter, uh, so similar in its content, Colossians chapter 3. Same point is made there. If you're risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God and set your affection not on things above, but on, uh, I'm sorry, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Christ who is our life shall appear. Then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify. Put to death. 
your members upon the earth. And he goes through a list of things, fornication and uncleanness, evil desire, idolatry, all these things. He says, verse 6, for which sake, I'm sorry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience in the which he also walked sometimes when you lived in them. Now put off all thee. And he goes through another list. But that's the point. You live in sin as long uh, as you stay in it. And you can't repent of sin while you're living in it. If you're going to be one who uh, uh, repents of idolatry, you've got to stop worshiping idols. If you're going to repent of stealing, you've got to stop stealing. If you're going to repent of adultery, you've got to stop it. So quitting the sin is always a part of, uh, uh, of repentance and, and calling on the grace of God to cover us while we're wallowing in sin is a poor excuse for repentance. One more point that I want to make here, and this was also specified in the question, you know, does the New Testament require restoration to be forgiven of any sin? Uh, I do think we read about such things in the Scriptures, don't we, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The story in, in Luke 19, we don't have time to tell it all, but we all remember the story of Zacchaeus, Here's a publican uh, who just was enamored with Jesus and he heard he was coming to town. So he goes up because he's a small man in a tree so he can see him. And Jesus calls him by name. I'm going to eat at your house today. And uh, it's, it's just this beginning of this renaissance of this man's life. It just turns completely over. Uh, but when Jesus went to eat with him, this is where we pick up the story. Verse 7 of uh, Luke 19, all the people who saw this began to complain. Jesus is going to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Later, Zacchaeus stood up and announced to the Lord, Lord, I'll give half my possessions to the poor. I think he's making a pledge there of something he plans to do. This is a new day in his life, a new direction. And then he adds to it this, I'll pay four times as much as I owe if I have cheated anyone in any way. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this home. Uh, and he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save those that are lost. But you'll notice there, he said, if I have taken unlawfully from someone else, it's not sufficient for me just to say, well, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to give it back. In fact, I want to give back more than I took. As a penalty, uh, I think about the story in Philemon where Philemon is the one that, uh, the man that Paul wrote to about Onesimus, a runaway slave who Paul had come in contact with in Rome and had converted to Christ. And so he's sending him back. And at one point in the letter, Paul says, or he writes, if then you count me as a partner, receive him. Onesimus, as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that to my own account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention that you owe me even your own self besides. <laughs> but he said, I'm not going to call that now into account. I'm just going to tell you, I I'm going to pay whatever's been. Oh, I think there's restoration involved in that. Um, that there's something wrong with the picture, the idea of me stealing your car and then saying I repent and driving by your house every day waving at you from your car saying, I sure am sorry about that. Now, the point is, of course, there's some situations where we can't undo what we've done. Uh, and we're not able. Uh, David couldn't bring Uriah back from the grave. Uh, and, and so there are situations like that. But I do think when it, the opportunity affords, we certainly are not looking to profit from sin. There's something about the spirit of repentance that demands that uh, we want to try to right the wrong that we've done. Uh, like Proverbs 6, uh, where he talks about a thief uh, will restore sevenfold, forfeiting the entire value of his house if necessary. So other examples could be given. But I do think that's a part of that spirit. We don't intend to profit from sin. We instead hate what we've done so much that we look to try to rectify the situation that we've made. 
So what does repentance demand of us? Our time is up and you've listened well. This little brief reminder. Well, in the first place, it demands a genuine sorrow for sin. You know, how bad do you hate sin? That's what God would ask me. How bad does it really bother you? Are you doing something because somebody caught you? Are you doing something because somebody's putting the pressure on you? Or are you doing something because, as David said, against thee only have I sinned? Secondly, do we have the humility to confess our sin? <laughs> Own up to it, no excuses, to say, I'm wrong, it was me, and I am sorry. Thirdly, do we hate sin enough to quit it? Repentance demands that. And instead, to do the right thing. Not just quit the wrong, but do the right. And then to make whatever restoration we can of the problem that we've caused. I think all of these things are within our grasp, every one of us. It's a question of will. It's not a question of ability. And I would say this, too, as we close. I think it's good for me to remember that the opportunity is limited. That is, that God calls me now to repent. Whether I get tomorrow or not is another story, which is why we don't need to put off repentance. We need to make the changes we need to make now. And I'd, my life would be a lot better if I never forgot that. Don't put off to tomorrow assuming that you're going to have tomorrow what you know you ought to do now. So I hope that uh, little reminder was somewhat useful. Please get out your songbooks if you haven't already. Turn to the number that's been selected. And if you desire this morning to come to God, do so. His arms are wide open. Whatever it is that you need, whether it be to become a child of God or as a child of God to return to him, let me tell you, his arms are wide open. The constraint is on our part. And so if we can help you in any way in coming to God, we'd love to do that. Let us know how right now, while we stand, while we stand.